everybody. I'm glad you're able to join us for our session today. I have the absolute pleasure of introducing Rick Reisig. If I were to read his entire bio, we would not have any time for his session. So I'm going to have a couple of just the highlights. Um, Rick currently serves as the vice chair of NASBA and will be the, in, the ascending to the chair role next month. And it is not lost on us to not mess up the CPE for his session or this entire conference. <laughs> Um, but he also presently serves on the Financial Accounting Foundation, the FAFS Board of Trustees. He just wrapped up two terms on the Private Company Council, the PCC, and has an extended term on the AICPA's ASB Auditing Standards Board. Um, he serves as a continuing education instructor on various different topics and has served on the AICPA Board of Examiners, the AICPA's Practice Analysis Sponsor Advisory Group, and he's served on the CPA Model Curricular Committee. He's over 40 years of public accounting experience at Anderson Zill Muller, is the current CEO, not 40 years as the CEO. I, I assume it's not 40 years as the CEO, but that would be impressive. <laughs> and, and recently, that's my bad in reading, and recently just announced a big firm merger into Pinion at the start of the year. So without further ado, Rick, please take it away. All right, thanks, Danielle. And I trust uh, you can hear me okay. Uh, and we're ready to go. Uh, thanks, everybody, for the opportunity to, to be with you today. Um, as uh, Danielle introduced, I'm Rick Reisig here in Anderson Jermulin in Montana. Uh, we're Montana-based, and uh, it's a gorgeous day here. I hope it's a, a nice day wherever you are, too. Um, we are very happy MindBridge users here at the firm, and so I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to, to participate in, in this year's conference. As the slide indicates, I'm the current NASBA Vice Chair, as Danielle introduced me, and, and ascending to the chair position on November 1. Really, the significance of that for me is really to emphasize how important the issue of the talent pipeline is to me, and it should be to all of you. Of course, that's the topic for today, is, is advancing the talent pipeline through use of technology, and that's really critical right now within the profession. So we'll talk quite a bit about that in the next 50 minutes, and hopefully if you weren't aware of all the things that are happening within the profession and the focus on the talent pipeline, hopefully you'll be more informed at the end of the 50 minutes. So really both from the perspective of an employer of accountants, like I am, and the perspective of a regulator who wants to ensure the public has access to accountants and all the services that they offer, a talent pipeline is, is pretty critical and pretty important to me. Um, I also served as the co-chair of the core curriculum task force of the NASBA AICPA model curriculum project, which was a significant component of the CPA Evolution Initiative, that'll be a big part of the focus of today's segment, too, to let you know what's happening uh, on that regard with the talent pipeline. So in beginning the discussion of the talent pipeline, we first need to understand what the new talent is being asked to do. You know, what are the trends in the profession? Well, of course, we're all aware of what's been going on in the profession and our business environment, which affects all of us in everything that we do, right? Technological innovation is touching everything we do, every minute of every day, leading to a more complex marketplace. The more complex our marketplace, the more expansive our body of knowledge has to be to meet the marketplace needs, right? Those procedures that were historically performed by newly licensed CPAs yesterday are today being performed by automation or offshore or performed by paraprofessionals. Now, entry-level CPAs, or the expectation would be entry-level CPAs, are performing more procedures much earlier in their career than what I did, certainly, that require deeper critical thinking, enhanced problem-solving skills, and professional judgment. Those responsibilities that were traditionally assigned to more experienced personnel that are now being pushed down or assigned to the newly licensed CPA. Now, every two years, the AICPA issues a trends report. It's a report on accounting education, the CPA exam, and public accounting firms hiring of recent graduates. You could Google it. You can obtain those, uh, the report. Uh, it's uh, free to you. It's accessible. Information from this slide comes from the AICPA trends reports from 2017, 2019, and 2021. The AICPA is updating their trends report later this fall to be issued in 2023. So firm hiring of accounting graduates has been slowing over the years. Now, using 2014 as a base 
And the reason why we're using that as a base is that was the year with the highest number of accounting graduate hires. So in 2016, firm hiring of accounting graduates went down 19% when compared to 2014. In 2018, firm hiring of accounting graduates went down 29% when compared to 2014. And in 2020, firm hiring of accounting graduates went down 36% when compared to 2014. And yet overall firm hiring stayed relatively flat. So CPA firms are hiring fewer accounting grads and more non-accounting grads. That's what that statistic is telling us. Now this decreasing trend is not expected to reverse. If it does reverse, it's anticipated it will be because of the consulting and advisory services, um, particularly as focused on technology um, than what the traditional services will offer. Now let's consider a, a accounting program enrollment. Now this comes from a 2021 CPA Evolution Pulse Survey. Schools are telling us that their students are picking up on the hiring trend just as, uh, as well as we are. And with 54% of the accounting programs reporting declining accounting uh, undergrad enrollments. Now COVID-19 didn't do us any favors. I think we all understand that. Uh, in the fall of 2020, 560,000 undergrads put off going back to college. So not only were less students selecting accounting, but less came back to campus until we got through the pandemic. And really, I think all of us would, would acknowledge that those numbers haven't rebounded quite like what we'd want them to rebound. So we have a lot of things going on um, to affect our pipeline. So now we know the number of accounting grads are de decreasing. Of course, that's represented, uh, representative with the dark and light bars on this particular slide. Orange bars, excuse me. And we know CPA exam takers are down too, represented by the blue and green lines. But really the takeaway on this particular slide, the alarm I think on this particular slide, that I'd like you to take away is that there's a widening gap between the accounting graduates and those who actually sit for the exam. So not only do we have less accounting graduates, we have an ever um, decreasing trend of those accounting graduates that are sitting for the exam. If you look at the period from 2012 to 2017, exam takers represented about 55% to 60% of accounting graduates. In 2017, that percentage started to decline, and we, we're now at about 40% of graduates taking the exam. We obviously need to get that percentage up. Now, the spikes you see in this graph, the spikes you see in 2010 and 2016 are exam takers who accelerated taking their sections before a new exam was launched. Now that's common, understandable, and there's always a dip the year after when, the, when there's a normalization uh, bounce back. That bounce back didn't occur as we expected after the 2017 exam launch. And to pile on, we also saw a dip in 2020 due to COVID. Um, but we didn't see the bounce back that we expected there either. And as you would expect, the AICP and NASB are all over this and are working to try to get uh, those folks back into the system of taking the exam. Lastly, we're launching the CPA Evolution exam, which we'll talk here about more here in a second. But we're launching the CPA Evolution exam in 2024, and we think that we'll, there will be a spike at the end of 2023 and possibly an even deeper dip than normal in 2024 because the exam is changing so much. And we'll talk a little bit about that. We obviously don't want that to happen, and we've just started our student campaign to get the right messaging to the right people at the right time uh, on this particular issue. So what skills is the marketplace telling us are actually needed? There are a variety of studies out there that talk about the skills gaps, and a bit later I'll share exactly what CPA firms are telling us. But at the macro level, skills that emphasize critical thinking, analysis and problem solving, place a premium on innovation and creativity, and leverage emerging technologies, just like what we're doing with MindBridge, uh, are highly valued. While the World Economic Forum Future of Jobs Report, which is what this was gleaned from, says these skills will be needed by 2025, I think most of us would say they're needed today. I mean, we can't wait till 2025, and it's already, this was, uh, the study was done in 2020, uh, it's already 2022 going into 23. 
um, we're behind the curve already. And so the pandemic actually accelerated everything as far as uh, our thinking on, on this. All of this is why NASBA and the AICPA established the CPA Evolution Initiative. This is a joint effort uh, between the AICPA and NASBA. The goal is to evolve the CPA licensure model to better reflect the skills and knowledge needed in today's and the future marketplace. Within the three E's of licensure, we have education, examination, and experience. CPA evolution focuses on two of the three, and that's education and examination. So the idea is to first provide our students the education they need to succeed in our technology-driven marketplace. Then, okay, that's the education part of the three E's, then revise the CPA exam to adapt to the changing skill sets and competencies that our candidates will need to have in order to succeed in the technology-driven marketplace. Okay, the second part of the three E's examination. So let's talk about those. So let's start by talking about the examination because that's the easy one to start with. I hope most of us by now are familiar with this pictorial representation of the new exam model for licensure. It begins with a robust core of accounting, auditing, and tax uh, with technology interwoven amongst the three. At the very beginning of the discussion, there was uh, some contemplation of making technology a fourth part of the core, and yet the realization was that technology is, needs to be interwoven in all of those different uh, core services, audit, uh, accounting, and tax. So it begins with that robust, that robust core, and then candidates will also select one of three different disciplines to do a deeper dive, to get uh, more in-depth knowledge, whether it be tax compliance and planning, business analysis and reporting, or information systems and controls. And it's the information systems and controls that we hope will be the real hook to, to bring many that have that kind of a, a desire, a, a goal to focus their careers on into the, the CPA fold. That, that's really what we hope to be the hook. So what are, what are the benefits of the new model? Of course, uh, the strong core with accounting, auditing, tax, again, technology interwoven, uh, deeper knowledge in one of the three primary disciplines, as a regulator, I can tell you, we hope that enhances public protection because the, the foundational knowledge of the candidates will be broader, will be stronger uh, and more focused. Reflects the reality of practice, what's happening today uh, uh, in our environment where our candidates need to have more of a technology feel. It's adaptive and, ref uh, and flexible, we hope, and it maintains the one CPA license uh, terminology. There isn't going to be a CPA audit or a CPA tax or a, or a CPA systems. Uh, a CPA is a CPA, and we think that's, uh, um, that's what's strong about our profession. So what's next? Uh, let's focus first on the CPA exam. So we've heard a lot of questions about this model and how it will work. So let's walk through some of the common questions uh, that are being asked. What content might appear in each discipline? Well, the content of the exam was somewhat determined uh, through an exam practice analysis that took place over the past two years, starting in 2020. Many of you might have participated in some session or some forum uh, of which you offered up your thoughts on the practice analysis. An exposure draft of the new exam blueprint, specifying the exam content. Um, closed for comment just last week on September 30th of 2022. Some of you might have read the exposure draft and maybe provided commentary. If you did, thank you very much for doing that. So we do have an idea of what kind of content might appear in each discipline. Uh, it is a work in progress. And so the letters I'll just describe for you again, ISC is Information Systems and Controls, BAR or BAR is Business Analysis and Reporting, and TCP, Tax Compliance and Planning. So look at the different um, just the different categories within, within each of the different disciplines. So we have information systems and controls, you have business processes, information systems, information security and governance, IT audits, and system and organization control engagements, or SOC engagements. Many of us in public practice uh, probably perform SOC engagements, or we might perform an attest engagement for a client who also gets a SOC engagement uh, for a, a, a particular service that they might offer. 
this is more and more needed uh, within the marketplace. So ISC will focus more in that particular area. BAR would be the more traditional. Uh, data analytics, finance risk management and planning, more advanced technological accounting and reporting, um, state and local government accounting. This was very, I'll say controversial, I guess, during the process of the practice analysis and even in the exposure draft of the blueprint on just where state and local government um, accounting and auditing topics will, uh, will be contained. Um, it was removed from the core uh, in the process of discussion of the practice analysis and placed in the discipline. So, um, so if you have a candidate who wants to focus uh, on state and local government issues, now there'll be some, um, some reference to it, some um, touching of it in the core, uh, but the more in-depth analysis of accounting and auditing for state and local governments would happen in the bar discipline. And you have the tax compliance and, and planning, and of course, that leads us to more advanced or in-depth discussions of individual tax topics or entity tax topics, such as corporations, partnerships, and so on. And then personal financial planning, um, and of course, property transactions. Again, more focused in the discipline. So, uh, regarding the disciplines, we get a lot of questions about which disciplines um, which discipline students are most likely to select and whether students will just pick the easiest discipline. <laughs> well, um, I'm here to tell you uh, that I'm, I'm fairly certain that our board of examiners and the, the different uh, subgroups will make it to where each of the disciplines have equal amount of rigor and challenge. Uh, that's pretty critical. So I don't think it will be possible for a candidate to game the system uh, and pick a discipline because they think it might be the easiest one uh, the, the idea, the, the goal would be each of the disciplines will, again, have the same amount of challenge and rigor. So uh, based on uh, their interest and preparation, students may find one discipline uh, more attractive or more to their liking uh, than another. Frankly, uh, the discipline that a candidate selects could very well be um, as a result of the different uh, college or university that they attend, because the, the expectation would be as the evolution initiative evolves, and, and we'll get into the, the education piece here in a second, but the expectation would be that some of the colleges and universities will focus in more, uh, more in one discipline than another, just because of the type of uh, uh, courses that they offer, the type of educators that they employ, and so on. Uh, we, we would always encourage the students to pursue the discipline that best aligns with their intended area of practice. That doesn't mean that that's where their career will, will need to go. So if I took um, or focused on the bar um, discipline in passing the CPA exam, that doesn't mean that that's the d direction that my career has to take. It just means that's the discipline that I focused on in passing the exam. Um, it may be that when I start my career, I might be more inclined to, to bend towards the technology fields. Um, and so that, that's an important part to, to, uh, to understand about this, is that the discipline that the candidate selects for testing is not um, necessarily the direction that they're destined to uh, follow within their career. Okay, now let's focus on the candidates. A student poll survey was taken asking the question, which discipline would you most likely to select? Well, as you can see from the pie chart, about half the students would select BAR or business uh, and reporting, uh, business analysis and reporting, and the other half would split between TCP, tax compliance and planning, and ISC, information systems and controls. Well, I think we all get that. That's understandable, right? Because as most students, right now at least, are taking uh, traditional accounting and uh, classes, courses. And so they've had more exposure thus far to bar type topics. So that's not, um, that's not surprising right now uh, as far as that's the kind of results uh, that are coming from the Pulse survey. Now when we drill down into the results of the accounting majors that have a, a tech focus, such as those with a double major or minor information systems or data analytics, we found that over 60% of those students would select ISC, or Information Systems and Controls. 
Okay, so you, you and, and again, that's where we think there'll be a, a, a capture of a lot of those candidates or, or students who want to get more into technology and didn't realize that there's a future in the accounting industry uh, that matches up their interests. Okay, so that's, that's a big driver of the CPA Evolution Initiative. Well, and when we ask faculty to tell us what they think their students will pick, the results match up with what the students would say. And again, I think that's understandable because when the Pulse survey was taken, keep in mind a lot of the, the faculty was still teaching traditional accounting uh, courses. And as the evolution process takes hold with our educators, the, the thought would be, the expectation would be there would be a broadening of the curriculum uh, or a, a switching or a migration of curriculum into a particular way, depending again on the goals and objectives of that particular educational institution. So let's focus on the educators. So um, as we reach out to more and more faculty, certain common questions are starting to emerge, as you can see here. Um, so how likely will CPA evolution impact accounting programs? Excuse me. Well, faculty wanted to know how big a change this is going to be. Well, what we expect and what we feel, and in conversation with the faculty as they've been involved in this process as we've went along, for many schools, it's really thought that the curriculum will be uh, in, a, in a mode of evolution versus revolution. So much of what the courses and educators are teaching today will still be relevant, maybe broadened out, uh, and uh, uh, to touch on certain of the, uh, the topics that we'll talk about here in a second with the gap analysis. And those are the key areas that, are, that, um, that have emerged as we talked about what are the needs in the marketplace and what we would want the educators to focus um, their educational um, courses uh, towards uh, getting the candidates ready for what the marketplace needs are. When asked what skills and competencies are needed by professional staff, here's what the firms are saying. They need uh, candidates that have digital acumen, uh, certain types of data analysis skills, IT general controls and cybersecurity awareness, information process controls awareness and systems and organization controls awareness. Now again, what we're talking about here from a, a CPA evolution initiative and, and trying to match it up with college and university curriculum is what does the newly licensed CPA, the newly licensed uh, um, candidate, um, usually one to two years out from school, what do they need to know? And so that's where I mentioned here the awareness piece. Um, you might be uh, li sitting there in your firm and think, well, my gosh, yeah, we have our, our newly licensed CPAs working on our SOC engagements, but um, uh, you know, they're, they're not ready to, to, to manage the SOC engagement by themselves. We understand that. Uh, but really what the firms are telling us is we still want those candidates when they come to us and within one or two years of, of, uh, of working uh, either on their own or for us, um, to have that kind of awareness of, of those technology type issues. Now a survey was sent to over 1,200 accounting and de uh, department chairs of which 317 responded asking them, what are they teaching? Are they teaching data analytics, IT audit, cybersecurity, and more courses? So here's what the, the faculty had to say. 64% um, responded that they are teaching a course in data analytics. 40% said uh, they're teaching a course in predictive analytics. 23% SOC engagements. 23% digital acumen. 40% cybersecurity. 63% IT audit. 41% IT government uh, governance. And 43% IT risk. This is a pretty critical graph <laughs> because what it does, it compares the results of the gap analysis to the faculty pulse survey. So the gray bar on the far left, uh, as you're looking at your, your screen, shows the percentage of programs currently covering these particular topics, systems and organization controls, IT governance, information process controls, cybersecurity, and types of data analysis. The black, uh, bar on the far right shows the percentage of firms who tell us 
they need those skills. They want our newly licensed CPAs uh, to have the, that kind of a skill set or awareness. The blue in the middle shows the percentage of programs as of right now, or when the, uh, the surveys were taken, that were planning to increase coverage in those areas. So as you can see, there's still a lot of gap between what the marketplace say, says our needs are and what our colleges and universities are offering or planning to offer. Okay, that's, that's where we're, that's a big part of the CPA evolution discussion is to try to get to where we're matching those up more closely. That brings us to the CPA evolution model curriculum. We won't spend a whole lot of time on this, uh, but I thought it was important to at least cover it and make you aware of what's happening out there with your colleges and universities. Um, and many of you might be um, recent graduates of that that are participating in the sessions uh, uh, yesterday and today. Um, and so you might even be able to speak more uh, specifically about maybe some of the changes that you noticed as you were finishing up your uh, college and university careers. So first, the CPA Evolution Model Curriculum, what it's not. It's a model curriculum. It's not required for CPA licensure. Uh, what is required in most jurisdictions is a bachelor's degree, which includes a certain number of credits in designated accounting courses and non-accounting courses. The model curriculum doesn't change that. Again, it's a model. It's, it's a suggestion for colleges and universities to, uh, to adapt and, and uh, maybe redirect some of the things that they're doing already for their students. It's not inclusive of content traditionally addressed in business prerequisites, uh, such as principles of financial accounting, principles of managerial accounting, economics, finance, business law. It's expected those would still be offered without change or interruption. Okay, that's that's the those are the uh, the, the pre core courses that there's there's no change in those. What is in the CPA evolution model curriculum. It's arranged to try to match up with a new CPA exam structure, core and discipline tracks. So you see here uh, a core with familiar content, intermediate accounting, accounting information systems, auditing principles, intermediate managerial accounting, intro to tax. Discipline tracks focused on advanced content, advanced financial accounting, advanced managerial accounting, advanced accounting data analytics, information systems, assurance and advisory, and advanced individual and entity tax. Now, I think you could understand when you look at the discipline parts, how a college or university, depending on where they're at, and depending on their resources and their, the, um, the focus of their, their professors, how they may focus in a particular discipline. If you looked at, the, at all of the, the, what's offered in the different disciplines, um, it might be very difficult for a particular college or university to focus on all three of the disciplines. They may focus on what they've always done, which might be bar. They may be, because they're a technology-driven university, focus more on the information system and controls piece. Uh, so I think you get a sense of that to where there's some universities who have the resources. They can, they can expand in all three. Others may form partnerships with other, ent other uh, institutions to provide the greatest opportunity for their, for their students. So the question uh, that we've asked uh, on our survey of what if accounting programs were aligned with CPA evolution, where we have, uh, uh, imagine that every accounting program ideally instituted revisions to their curriculum to align with the CPA evolution initiative. We have a core. All students are expected to complete the core in financial accounting, audit, tax, um, and then we have the disciplines between uh, information systems and controls, uh, business analysis and reporting, and tax compliance and, uh, and planning. Well, um, the responses uh, that firms were telling us, if we were able to offer that ideally, uh, firms with 11 plus CPAs um, responding to the survey, 83% uh, said the hiring of new graduates from accounting programs would likely increase. Um, because those graduates would be considered more valuable. That's, that's the needs that they have. Now recall the previous slides we looked at where it showed the dipping in um, the decrease, the significant decrease from 2014 to now in firms hiring accounting graduates. 
and hiring, and yet they're still hiring, but just not accounting graduates, they're telling us if they had those skill sets, if, um, if the curriculum were adjusted to where the candidates came out um, of the college and university and to them, um, the three percent that they would hire those individuals. And, and so uh, uh, that's pretty real. Now, of course, it's easy to say that in a survey, uh, but we think it's very factual, and that's, that's what's driving um, the evolution initiative. Okay, I didn't really want to get too much into the into auditing standards, but I did want to touch on one in particular um, that I feel is, and I think you'll uh, already get a sense of this too, is directly related to all that you're doing with technology, and that's SAS 142. So SAS 142, audit evidence, it supersedes AUC 500, which is of course, termed audit evidence, where the focus is more on the results of procedures performed, the attributes and factors of evidence obtained, rather than the performance of the procedures themselves. And I think we get that. It's responsive to how entities operate with technology. And acknowledging certain information obtained by the auditor via technology may be more relevant, much like what we're finding with usage of MindBridge, right? It recognizes that audit evidence has evolved. It contemplates auditors' use of technology along with data and the sources of information available to the auditor that were present that were previously not available. It, it just recognizes there's lots of ways of, of obtaining information today. The emphasis is on the use of audit data, audit data analytics and that it's not an audit procedure, but it's rather a technique um, the auditor uses in meeting the objective of an audit procedure. So it's not a procedure in and of itself. If we use MindBridge, like all of us are doing, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, that's not the procedure in and of itself. Rather, that's a technique to help us with a particular procedure that we're performing uh, on a, uh, uh, in assessing an assertion. Now, SAS 142 is effective for periods ending on or after December 15th of 2022. So we're all planning for it now if we haven't uh, prior to, to now. So this cube, I think, is pretty, uh, I, I suspect you've seen it uh, before, but I think it kind of tells the tale. It summarizes how all the key provisions of attributes and factors intersect together. So you have, uh, and it's kind of hard to read uh, the words on the cube, uh, but that talks about relevance and reliability, sources, and corroborates or contradicts. Now, the old standard the focus was on the design and performance of procedures, right? It's, uh, uh, we will document that we performed this procedure and that was our audit evidence. The new standard focuses on the evaluation of the information obtained from performing the procedure. In, uh, it focuses on the results of the procedures. So really now, under SAS 142, audit evidence really is a sum of information plus the procedures. Now the information either, is either going to corroborate or contradict the assertion that we're that we're testing. Information sources is a byproduct of either management-driven information, external-driven information, or auditor-driven information, such as from the use of data analytics. So the quantity the quantity of evidence is no longer the focus of sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Recall that it used to be, uh, right? That, that, that as long as we had so many numbers uh, of a, uh, within a procedure, we felt that we would uh, we had the proper audit evidence. Now the focus more so is on the quality of information obtained. That's the driver of sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Again, relevance and reliability is, is critical. Uh, we'll talk more about that here in the next slide uh, as far as the obtaining of, of information. Corroboration and contradiction of management's assertions is important, and the precision and detail of information is, is certainly critical. SAS 142 notes that the auditor should consider the relevance and reliability of the information. We all understand relevance and reliability is absolutely critical uh, to the information that we're receiving. The data considerations, where are we getting the data? What's the source of information? Uh, and what's the nature of the information? Uh, are we getting the right information? 
Attributes that affect reliability would, of course, uh, include uh, accuracy, completeness, authenticity, and susceptibility to management bias. All of those are critical considerations that we have to have with our assessment of the information that we're receiving. And of course, evaluating information obtained, just like always, involves maintaining professional skepticism. Uh, that's discussed pretty specifically in SAS 142, um, and the consideration of unconscious or conscious auditor bias. We have to be, we have to be, um, we have to acknowledge what bias we may have in, uh, in interpreting the information uh, that we receive. So sources of information is obviously an important consideration. The reliability, the reliab, excuse me, the reliability of audit evidence increases when it's obtained from external parties, uh, because the information is less susceptible to management bias. Right? It's not coming from the inside the entity; it's coming from outside the entity. We all we all get that. Information obtained directly from the auditor, okay, observation of the application of an internal control uh, may be more reliable than information obtained indirectly uh, or by uh, by inference, and I think that goes without saying, and information in documentary form, whether paper or electronic, may be more reliable than evidence obtained through oral inquiries. That's all um, in included in SAS 142. I don't think it's any uh, great revelation, no real change in what you're doing right now, but it emphasizes that as we assess audit evidence. And the using of electronic information may require the auditor to perform additional audit procedures to establish its reliability including testing of internal controls over preparation and maintenance of the information. I think that's a pretty critical and important piece of SAS 142, and I bet you do too when you're using, your mind, using MindBridge to, to glean out information that we need uh, within our audits, right? It's, it's electronic information that we're obtaining from the client. We have to understand how the client is maintaining that information that we are using and extracting that information from to make, uh, to make judgment. Um, and we'll get into that more here in a second too. But I think that's a critical piece of SAS 142. Now it also says, emphasizes, that the auditor should consider whether the information either corroborates or contradicts the assertions in the financial statements. For example, corroborating information from sources independent or outside of the entity may increase the assurance of information that is generated internally, right? If we have something that management has provided to us internally and we get outside uh, confirmation, I think that's a pretty important piece. Or if we get outside contradiction, I think that's a pretty important consideration. Um, SAS 142 directs us that the auditor shouldn't consider contradictory information in isolation, but rather as part of the auditor's consideration of information obtained with respect to the assertion as a whole. So just because something occurs to us that contradicts the information that we get, um, we need to, to consider how that affects all the, the rest of what we're doing. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's just, I think as we process the information, um, I think uh, is reasonable for us to, to, to make that judgment. So under the old standard, sufficiency may have been more focused on quantity. Under the new standard, sufficiency is also affected by the quality of the audit evidence obtained, right? Um, we've already discussed the concept that the audit data, audit data analytic is not a procedure, but rather a technique used while performing a procedure. Okay, so I just wanted to touch on this, just how we use it. So all of, I think most of you are MindBridge users, just like us. And so one of the things that we had to do, and I suspect you did too, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer this up as part of the discussion, but rest assured you probably have better examples that you could share uh, certainly with me and the rest of the group on what your firms are doing um, as you document your usage of MindBridge or other audit data analytics, um, but we've, We've tried to anticipate the changes that were um, being brought forth with SAS 142 and tried to make sure that our documentation mirrored um, how we intended to use the results from MindBridge. So that's why I offer this up, again, just for, to give you our, your perspective on what we do. And, and again, I wish we were in a live environment to where I could find out from you all that you guys do, uh, too, because I would learn a lot, I'm sure, just from that, uh, that discussion. So um, 
as again, we're we're happy MindBridge users. We're, we're we we love it. We think it does um, does do great things for us. I can be honest with you, and again, I wish we were in a, a live environment so I could get feedback from you on how you perceive it. Um, we're still a work in prog progress, I would say, on having um, the usage of audit data analytics be a uh, supplant of some of our audit procedures rather than a supplement to our audit procedures. I think we all understand that we, we hope that the, the, the benefit of the audit data analytics is to get a better audit. Uh, to, to get better information because now we're able to use maybe 100% population and, uh, and identify where our risk areas are. And we also know that usage of that, because it's somewhat of a transformation in our thought process, again, going from the quantity of information um, as the, the definer of sufficient appropriate audit evidence to being the quality of information obtained, um, trying to turn that switch uh, from a documentation standpoint and also philosophically from an assessment of the information we're getting and having faith that we've done enough. Um, we're a work in progress in that, and I won't lie to you. We're, we're much better than what we were a couple of years ago, and yet we're still evolving. We're still evolving with that. And, and again, I'd love to hear from you on how you all are evolving in that too. But um, anyway, we put together just a template memo for us uh, for our uh, work paper documentation um, to try to uh, touch on what we felt we needed to uh, document our consideration of the information that we're getting and using MindBridge to help us assess. So uh, again, not that this is uh, any kind of uh, authoritative guidance because it's not. It's just a discussion that we had internally. So first thing we knew, we needed to document how did we verify the completeness and accuracy of the data provided. And of course, as we put together our internal memo, we had a lot of discussions with MindBridge uh, uh, personnel that helped guide us and help us understand the process. Much like the sessions that occurred yesterday and even today on how MindBridge uh, really works and how does it identify anomalies and how does it identify uh, the particular risks and the stratification of the risks. Uh, we needed to have an understanding of that. So uh, we verify the completeness and accuracy of the data that's been provided because if it's not complete or accurate, obviously the information can't possibly be reliable and relevant. Then we needed to, to document how do we verify the account mapping uh, because we needed to understand the account groupings to make sure comparisons and assumptions have some validity, right? We have, so we have to understand how does that mapping occur to where we're, when we're making those kind of uh, comparisons, whether it be between periods or maybe even between um, like entities um, that they, they uh, were making valid comparisons. And of course, the performance of the risk assessment and our consideration of how does, um, do we understand the MindBridge methodology and how it identifies the anomalies? And then how do we determine how those uh, anomalies identified um, mix in with our risk assessment? So we all, we knew we needed to have that kind of documentation in place. And so uh, again, this, this template or this memo is expanded for each of our engagements where we address each of these particular areas. And again, we think we need to, and we think that's what SAS 142 uh, drives us to because it's allowing us to, to use this mechanism as part of our audit procedures. Um, but it also, uh, I think, tells us that we have to document how we've answered the questions of uh, reliability and relevancy and accuracy and completeness and, and those type of things, which again is the whole uh, bedrock of why we would use MindBridge in our particular engagements. Okay, so uh, let me get to the questions here if I could. Uh, just uh, as far as the answer to the polls, so I uh, give you an, uh, an idea of, of who's there. Um, really, most of you get your, uh, your new staff from uh, new college grads with accounting degrees. So, so you're out there hiring those um, accounting graduates, and I hope uh, your, your thought would be that you, you want them to have some kind of background in, in some kind of a IT related um, IT related awareness. That might be the, the better way to say it, is that uh, 
uh, whether it be with SOC engagements or IT controls. Um, I know for us, we've looked um, too, not only with those accounting grads, but those in technology related fields as well. But if we have CPA candidates who have more of that uh, exposure to, to SOC engagements, um, we think that would help us a great deal or, or they would hit the ground running, um, we think, uh, in, in a quicker fashion. Um, let's see, just looking at some of the chats. Um, Right, you mentioned that technology um, and data literacy skills are important to you. I think that's great. I, I hope you appreciate the direction of the CPA uh, Evolution Project. Um, uh, one of the chats would be, um, are we doing something big for SAS 142? Um, right, I, I think that the question was, have you heard of firms that are doing something big or different for 142? Uh, the response is we're not doing a big implementation and a large update to our methodology, but just more enhanced focus. Absolutely. Because um, I think even when you look at, I think the struggle for us, as I mentioned, isn't that we're really doing an, a, a wholesale change in our procedures, but trying to figure out how can we use audit data analytics in a more efficient manner, again, to supplant some of the things that we have been doing uh, prior to its usage versus as a supplement, because we don't want it to be an add-on, because if we're still continuing to do what we've always done, and now we have the ability to look at 100% of the uh, of the transactions in the population, uh, then really we're, we're, we're doing a duplication, or we might even be... Uh, making a, a wrong risk assessment. And, and so uh, so we've really, I think that's where we've tried to, to adjust what we've done and implementing SAS 142 uh, versus doing a wholesale changeover. Um, how, do you, how do you train to get those extra tech skills um, on the job at your firm? Uh, you know, that'll be a challenge. And that's one of the things that the CPA Evolution uh, Initiative has even discussed is knowing what our newly hired uh, and newly licensed CPAs will do, and the background that they will have, what about the rest of us that didn't have the opportunity for that? I know uh, the AICPA has a lot of different courses out there that talk about usage of audit data analytics. Again, not specifically um, with MindBridge, but again, use of audit data analytics as a tool. I think that might be a, a great uh, resource that will be for us in trying to get our uh, our mid-level staff that are now directing the newly licensed CPAs um, more on the same page as far as usage of our uh, of the audit data analytics. I know for us, we've uh, identified a team uh, of folks that actually uh, dive into this and use them as the trainers for the rest of us. And uh, that, and of course, they have that desire and that uh, that ability, that technological. Um, focus that makes it easy for them to just step right in and learn all that they can about usage of tools like MindBridge and then train the rest of us. Right, and that's that's the other critical issue. The question was, how do you get the, the newly licensed uh, staff to, to uh, or even our mid-level, to stop using uh, the checklist mentality and, and using the deeper critical thinking skills and, uh, and analysis? And that's uh, we're focusing on that too. You know, we're trying to identify certain educational uh, sessions that we can then provide on how we train our people to to, to think more holistically and and to uh, be able to tell the story for the client rather than just tick off on a checklist. What is the information telling us, and how can we communicate that? How can we use that particular skill set of communication to better tell the client? Um, this is the information we've obtained, and this is how it's benefiting you because of what we're now seeing with the information that we've we've obtained. Um, you know, that's that's a critical piece. That's that's the add-on. That's the thing that that um, makes us uh, uh, more deliverable in, in the procedures that we're performing. Is that extra information that we're sending to the client because of the information now that we've been able to obtain through the use of our audit data analytics. Um, very, very important, very, very strong. Okay, last question. Uh, let's see. 
have you had any success in getting staff to challenge the old audit ways and place them with broader use? Yes. Yep. And, and I'll just finish on that as I've talked about. So that's a great question. And I and I've, I've touched on that. It, it is hard. It's hard to to have that switch in mindset where we have the comfortable and the uh, uh, what we're used to, and then having uh, what I'll say is a leap of faith uh, with what the information is um, that we're getting from MindBridge. That's why. Um, We've tried to have such a stronger understanding as far as what the information that MindBridge presents to us. We, we've had, uh, and MindBridge has been great at, at lending their staff to us to, to talk us through uh, each of the different levels of, of information that MindBridge presents to us and, and how, it's, uh, how does the algorithms work. I know we had some sessions yesterday on how the algorithms work. And it's all important for us to have that understanding and awareness because that's what then gives us faith and confidence that the information that we're getting is reliable, is relevant, and we can have faith in the, in the information that we're getting because of the, the, the service or the, um, the, the process that MindBridge goes through to identify those for us. So I think that's critical for any of us is to have that, that comfort, that level of, uh, of understanding to where we have faith in it. And, and that's been a process and will continue to be a process as we go forward. Well, um, I, I'll, I'll leave you be now. I've, I'm one minute over what my allotted time was. Hopefully you found this interesting. My objective was really to, to alert you to what's going on in the profession um, from the standpoint of, of almost a, the CPA Evolution Initiative and, and what we're trying to do with the talent pipeline and, re, and the recognition that technology is a big part of that. And for us to attract the best and brightest to the profession, uh, we need to understand that technology has to be a component uh, of that. And, and, uh, and our jobs isn't to make our, our staff um, um, work harder, but work smarter and technology a big part of that. And our marketplace demands that they have different skill sets, new skill sets, enhanced skill sets, um, and that's how we'll remain relevant as a profession and how we'll continue to get the best and brightest uh, in the profession, because that's all our goal. So um, I guess uh, uh, I'll stop sharing now, and, um, and, and thank you all for participating. And know that you're going to have a, a great rest of the day with all the other sessions that we have. I'm going to jump off of this one and get back into another session uh, that starts up here in 10 minutes. And, and thank you all for your attention, and I appreciate it, and good luck to all of you.